it's always the ones who have power who decide which stories should be heard more, which stories should be silenced. And whenever you write about something, you make a choice to make something heard and to silence about something. It's always about the choice and therefore the history as we see it now, it's based on the choice of, of other people who told that history. They have made some choice and, but also certain choices had more visibility than other choices. Welcome everyone to this panel discussion on artist Shubhigi Rao and her exhibition, These Petrified Paths, at the Rockbond Art Museum in Shanghai. My name is Joe Nuzu, Curator and Head of Research, Publications and Public Programs at the Rockbond Art Museum. And with my very great pleasure, I welcome and introduce Shubhigi Rao. Shubhigi Rao is a visual artist and writer based in Singapore. She is interested in histories and lies, literature and violence, archival system, ecologies, and natural history. Her films, art, texts, and photography look at current and historical flashpoints as perspectival shifts, examining contemporary crises of displacement of people, languages, cultures, and knowledge bodies. Her current decade-long project, Pulp, a short biography of the banished book, is about a history of book destruction and the future of knowledge. In 2020, the second book from the project won the Singapore Literature Prize, while the first volume was shortlisted in 2018. The first exhibition of the project, written in the margins, won the 2018 APP Signature Prize Juror's Choice Award. Shubigi is renowned for her distinctive ability to interweave complex and ever-expanding narratives, research and materials into multifaceted installations, films and drawings. Her work delves into the gaps and multiplicities of ideas and history, frequently employing marginalized and erased narratives and useful fictions to question the supremacy and dominance of knowledge and power. The exhibition, These Petrified Paths at the Rockbond Art Museum, is the first survey in China encompassing Shubigi's work from the past decade. The exhibition's title is derived from a newly commissioned feature length film, which intertwines tales and recollections of Armenian local communities into an enthralling narrative. It layers memory, written and spoken word dialogue, terrain, and everyday existence to pose the questions. Can storytelling from the margins serve as a conduit for recalling a nation's shared identity? Who determines the worthiness of knowledge or preservation? What is the connection between fossil fuel extravatism, energy supplies, and lost archives and books? By illuminating fragmented experiences, memories and often overlooked infrastructures of transmission of knowledge and energy. These petrified paths invites one to celebrate diverse forms of knowledge and to learn from the margins how to evolve beyond destruction, loss, death and entropy. Shubigi represented Singapore at the National Pavilion in the Venice Biennale in 2022. She has also been featured in the Art Pacific Triennial, Kochi Missouri's Biennial, Taipei Biennial, Hun Biennial, Singapore Biennial, and the Singapore Writers' Festival. 
and she was the artistic director of the 2022 Kochi Mizuri Race Biennial. And with this, I also want to welcome Catherine Adams and Alphonse Chu as a part of the conversation today. Catherine Adams is a writer and curator based in New York. She is currently the assistant curator at the Curtis R. Priam Experimental Media and Performing Arts Center at the Resenlia Polytechnic Institute, where she works on commissions across time-based visual arts and performance, curates public programs, and produces discursive projects that engage critical perspectives on contemporary art and its technological conditions. Her essays, scholarly articles, and art criticism have been published in Eflux Journal, After Image Journal of Media and Art, Media Art and Cultural Criticism, Eflux Criticism, Journal of Curatorial Studies, Flat Journal and Bomb Magazine. She was the first prize recipient of the 2022 International Award for Art Criticism. Other past curated exhibitions and programs include projects at the Hazel Museum of Art in New York, KW Institute for Contemporary Art in Berlin, and Miriam Gallery in New York. Alphonse Chu is an artist, writer, and curator based between Taipei, New Haven, and Singapore. Their practice investigates imaginaries of capitals and ideologies as shaped by media infrastructures and networked economies so as to contemplate possible futures for bodies, societies, and environment. Their current research revolves around a critical reading of the tropical belt as geoeconomic imaginary and neo-colonial hinterland through a situated analysis of plantation capital and infrastructure in Southeast Asia. They are the founder of the Center for Urban Mythologies, a critical research and artistic platform, artistic platform exploring the tropes and narratives for the urban condition to propose larger situated critiques of capitalism and Anthropocene positioned from the global south. They're also the program director of Sea Shorts, a pine Southeast Asia platform for short form moving images and were previously the Fall 2021 Eflux Journal Fellow. They are presently a master candidate at the Yale School of Architecture. Catherine and Alphonse will each be giving a presentation, followed by a discussion with Rubigi, moderated by ex Juno Well, the artistic director of the Wokban Art Museum and the exhibition curator of these petrified paths. As this is a recorded event, I hope you will understand that there will be no Q&A. Thank you, Shubigi. Thank you, Catherine. Thank you, Alphonse. And thank you, X. We look forward to your presentation and exchange. Thank you so much, Tony. And thank you, everyone, um, for watching and uh, for the invitation, X Shubigi. Um, it's really wonderful to be here and be in conversation with you about the show and about Shubigi's practice. Um, I'll go ahead and share my screen. Um, so um, I'll just go through um, my approach to uh, this particular presentation was to approach these petrified paths as a retrospective and think about the relationships between different bodies of work, but also specifically to think about operationality and to kind of center the overview around three core techniques that I'm reading across Shubiki's body of work which I think speak to one another and speak out from the show and then create common threads. So uh, I've kind of pulled this sort of uh, super brief um, terms just to capture these figures through which I'm thinking. So the, the blot, which is really about, of course, ink, but also about kind of territoriality and how that becomes a kind of mode through which things become legible. We see it illuminate uh, watermarks, for example, in the show. It's also a technique that gathers together the kind of context of printmaking through which a lot of Shubiki's uh, work has, has run. Um, it's also used within water, watercolor and works on paper, um, but I'm going to approach this really as a sort of um, uh, way that uh, certain kinds of um, text and um, writing is accessed within the show. 
And then the idea of the mark, um, which is not necessarily only about text, but really about drawing, sketching, orality, kind of the oral history as it's rendered visually and annotation. Um, I also think about it as the kind of leaf of the phylogenetic tree that can hold a concept, but is it slightly unruly, can kind of tangle with other uh, ideas on the tree. It's kind of wry and unpredictable and carries the sort of humorous element in many of Shubiki's works. And then lastly, the idea of the machine, um, which of course is very present in these petrified paths in particular as the kind of central pylon, but also um, as this kind of signifier of science, of systematicity, um, of modes of reproduction, and then kind of if the gallery space as not a white cube, but really as a zone where things happen and where things have functions in relationship to one another. So I will go to the next slide. Um, and as we start off, um, I wanted to kind of go back to a sort of brief overview, um, really to where the, almost before where the show starts. And there's a couple of handmade books in the show from 2005, but I, apart from that, I believe for the most part, these petrified paths show works uh, really from 2013 or later. And, and I think this year um, is a significant year within Shubiki's practice. Um, there's one series also from this year that's prominent in the show, Useful Fictions. It's the year before, um, or as sort of the first pulp is, is kind of getting uh, started and, and that project is being initiated. But also significantly, it is the year that um, S. Raoul is killed, so to speak, um, the pseudonymous alter ego that um, Shubiki worked with for some years um, up until 2013 and until uh, through whom until that point um, had been a kind of prism through which a lot of Shubiki's work and writing was refracted. And so S. Raoul is styled as kind of feeding into this cult of male genius. He writes these like kind of prolix and very um, kind of um, ornamental texts that um, are on the one hand very erudite but also whose aspiration to systematicity can be so extreme as to kind of push it over the edge to into the pseudoscientific. So I wanted to kind of start here with S. Raul as this kind of vanishing mediator of this year 2013 where I think we sort of see Shubiki's work emerge more kind of from her sort of um, explicit position. Um, Raul, as Raul was, was killed, um, in, by tripping over a, a 2018 work that I'll talk about called, um, River of Ink. But also I think, um, he's kind of this important early figure for a number of reasons, um, partly because he kind of embodies this kind of relentless injection of the subjective into what would otherwise appear to be an impartial account of meaning. So on the one hand, his writing and his modus operandi are kind of quite different from Shubigi's in, in the sense that Raoul wants us to know his erudition. He wants us to know the extent of his knowledge, his, his polymathy. And I think through that, even the very abstract tracts are kind of tinged with this air of desire for the reader's admiration. But I think what's interesting about this is because it, it is this, um, kind of tainting of, let's say, a neutral idea of knowledge by self-assertion. And so even though he's a figure that kind of recedes, I think he's a kind of figure that um, is a, offers a way of showing us the kind of hand of power within knowledge or the ghost in the machine of scholarly systematicity and kind of gives these things a feeling of unreality for us. Um, so I'll move into the first idea of blot. Sorry, I don't have a great picture there. Um, and some of these will be um, just kind of snapshots from my uh, photos as I went through the show. I, I really wanted to show details as we speak, just to get into the techniques. Um, so this is one of one segment of a, a work in these petrified paths that kind of captures what I mean by blot, also literally uses that term, a tragic blot on the landscape. And in several works, particularly in the 2013 useful fiction series in the show, um, text or or um, written content shows up, and, and also visual content shows up through the kind of loose inking of um, of ink onto the page. And so this technique um, kind of creates a situation in which the legibility of what we see is always context dependent. So it, it I think of it as this kind of territorial way of accessing um, uh, a word or a phrase. Um, 
and it's kind of styled as a as a sort of spatial way of of um, the visibility of language of knowledge. Um, and I think one interesting thing uh, here is is how um, this relates to and kind of undermines an idea of a, a Western taxonomic system that is without context. Um, and that's kind of a paraphrase of of an account that Shubegi has given in the past about how um, Western categorization kind of removes context from words and ideas. Um, she has contrasted that to the idea of kind of indigenous names that retain this contextual knowledge, this kind of ecology of how things work and what the words we use for them actually mean. Um, so I think one thing that the blot does in, in Shubi's practice is it gestures towards a kind of ecological level of language in which the, the availability of words is tied to a territory. Um, it indicates this ecological grounding. And then of course, in a more kind of prosaic sense, it, it obviously links uh, to a kind of um, practice of printmaking where uh, you know one is using etching to create um, a figure through in, in negative in negative form. Um, this is one um, past work. Um, this is actually the 28, uh, tw 2008 work, um, River of Ink, uh, that as Raul died from. Um, and I just wanted to show this again to bring this idea of inking, blotting back through um, into our kind of field of, of focus, but also to note how, um, like so many techniques that you should be is, is using, it's a kind of double-edged sword. It's not something that has kind of one meaning or approach. Here, this work is about kind of the saturation of something to the point of unreadability, the kind of drowning of the text. Um, and in an article on Shubigi's practice, Kate Sutton had offered a brief summation of the historical content of this particular work which I'll just read for you to give you the context. So quote, um, this work commemorated the raising of the House of Wisdom during the siege of Baghdad in 1258, when the rivers were said to have run black with ink, then red with blood. This act of unfathomable biblioclasm effectively decimated several centuries of thought, scholarship, and poetry. In doing so, it helped tip the scales, allowing other empires to eclipse the vast achievements of the Islamic golden age, unquote. And Jubi also narrates this as a work that uh, emphasizes the, as she puts it, the futility of preservation in the face of cultural genocide, unquote. Um, so clearly here, um, books are laden down with ink in a way that completely overwrites and destroys their contents. They become a kind of mass of materials that weighs itself down. And they're also quite literally pulp. Um, so again, I think uh, what I'd like to stress here is this kind of sense in which the blot and the stain, this creation of legibility through um, through ink and through saturation is, is uh, something that enables reading, but in excess can destroy it. And I think it's the case that um, this captures how with, with throughout uh, Shubigi's practice, preservation, of course, is a tool of conservation and, and it's important to allow access to knowledge, but it can also be destructive. It can be kind of, it can grow over and undermine itself um, in the way that uh, Western classifying systems can remove context from a work or digital archiving systems can maybe strip a text, a book of its annotations and its marginalia and all those important kind of material components of a book and its history. And then this is just another um, view of that previous work. Um, and it's, this has been described as a, a kind of failed inarticulate film set. That's a quote from the, the text on this work. And again, I think I would stress the kind of um, sense of maybe futility that's being looked at in this and, and the sense throughout, I think at least how I experience should be his practice that the idea that there's kind of no sort of pure gesture or way of working with books or knowledge, no eternally secure way to approach the book necessarily. Um, here's another sort of detail from the show, um, again, just to kind of drive home this kind of point of the blot as this kind of space that opens up the territory of the text. Um, here, it's clearly kind of a colonial symptom. It's a kind of, it's shown as this kind of, uh, um, as though one were treating the page as a, as a blank space, the land as a blank kind of un 
unlived, uninhabited space when in fact there's already something there. And the, the text here reads, we drove through Arcadia, but we didn't find it. Um, here's another just example. This is from the 2013 Useful Fictions again. The text reads, who needs a worldview outside of our purview? Um, and again, I think this is, I think here, I see this as kind of playing with this kind of suspicion around territoriality where we think of um, the purview as something that um, is our kind of access to knowledge, the collection of, of um, resources that we have in, in kind of cultural heritage, but also as a kind of constraint and potentially enclosed space. Um, and then I think also for me, the, the this kind of blotting is also about a, actually the act of reading, the kind of um, stain, so to speak, that, that reading itself kind of leaves behind. There's a part of these petrified pasts, a, a kind of annotation that talks about how um, the book as an object kind of impresses itself on us. It has an effect, even if its contents are forgotten. So I think there's that sense in which there's this kind of staining effect that is being played with. This is just another example, again, from Useful Fictions. This is a past work um, from 2013, um, Blotting the Ledger. Again, kind of variation on a theme. Um, and um, so I'm going to shift into the next idea. And as we shift out of uh, this kind of conversation around the blot and saturation, I, I wanted to offer sort of one other thought on the show and Shubhi's practice in relation to discourses on research-based art. And um, the writer Claire Bishop has offered a kind of interesting recent critique of research-based art that it's this sort of information overload or it's a visual saturation of our, of our faculties of analysis to the point where we can't kind of disagree with the picture it presents because there's so much information. And I really think that um, Shubigi's practice is kind of a subversion of this actually, and not even just a critique of it because of course she works with research. But um, I think there's this sensitivity to the ways in which um, uh, her works, you know, offer like a knowledge production without asserting it as knowledge necessarily. And I think um, the, the practice overall is really attuned to how ideas are, are co-constituted by concepts that might otherwise contradict them. Um, and so the exhibition in particular puts us in this kind of wonderfully difficult hinge position between ideas and their opposites works that kind of disagree with themselves, can discard themselves, um, overload themselves and, and potentially blot themselves out. And then we, as viewers, as, as readers have to also deal with that. Um, so here's this just literally marking the next um, section. Um, so this is, um, in moving to this section, I wanted to sort of um, acknowledge also a slight chronological shift in perspective that Shubigi has noted around the time of moving from the first to the second book of Pulp. And if um, the 2013 Useful Fiction series and the first Pulp were heavily focused on fiction and on the fabricated and untruthful, um, uh, writing around the second book of Pulp has noted that it was a bit more preoccupied with the stakes of being a bearer of stories and the stakes of truth and the ideas of truth that we construct together. Um, and I wanted to mention that here with this idea of the mark, because I, I think that that technique um, as a technique of kind of drawing, sketching is partially bound up with orality. Um, I believe also Shubi has talked about this in the past. So kind of the oral history uh, as a kind of way of mark making that's closer to speech than say painting. Um, and this kind of these loose designs, graphic marks are really a hallmark of a lot of the works on paper that we see in Shubiki's work. Additionally, um, we see this kind of uh, the sort of marking I'll talk about a lot in phylogenetic trees from, from the pra uh, Shubiki's practice. Um, they appear as this kind of like, um, let's say leaves of the tree, the sort of um, captioning. Um, and in general, I, I, I like the idea of, of marking in, in Chibi's practice as this kind of uh, cipher between different forms of articulation, which I will share more about. And this, um, this still is from um, one work in the exhibition called The Yellow Scarf, a film, uh, film video work. Um, so here's uh, just a small section of uh, tr uh, one of the phylogenetic trees. And again, sorry, this comes from my, just a snapshot that I took, but I just wanted 
you may not probably can't read these, but um, the words and the 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 leaves, let's say, of this tree state things like, quote, opinion as subjective, facts as objective, but it also says things like um, forms as content, um, progress as inevitable, and hinting increasingly at a kind of more paradoxical uh, kind of relationship to each concept where, um, you know, opposing ideas are held together. Um, and, and it's through marking, I think, often in Shabigi's work that we get, and, and specifically in these kind of phylogenetic trees, that we get some of the most amazing, like, wordplay and paradoxical formulations. Um, and specifically, also, I what I like of the trees is that, um, these phylogenetic trees, is that these sort of branches always kind of risk becoming entangled with each other, kind of like wrapping around, choking off the others and if the blot in a way was this condition of legibility in the work this kind of printmaking technique that allows things to be read the mark is this kind of more delicate whimsical and kind of mischievous side of expression that um kind of gets away with the acerbic aside or the jab at power and here's um a still from the yellow scarf again this is a video installation shown in the exhibition and is about the history of the thuggy cult in India, um, who were a group of assassins, but also specifically the work talks about how the colonial British administration sort of discovered the work, but um, also actually, or sorry, discovered the cult, uh, but actually destroyed it. Um, and so this, um, I'm not sure if, you, if this is legible on the screen, but the text says um, pernicious vice to be pulled out and strangled by the root. And as I was saying before with the phylogenetic trees, um, I wanted to sort of think about those, those trees in the context of this, this piece, um, because it's um, really, a, this work is thinking about a kind of fear of strangling um, expressed partially through ecology, um, but also about the kind of suppression of systems of indigenous knowledge. Um, and, uh, um, specifically, the strangler tree explored in the film is known for its adaptive ability to grow and strangle other trees. And I, I think it's interesting to just sort of follow this idea through also into the techniques that um, Shibigi is using in a lot of the works on paper in playing around with the ways in which a kind of um, concept is dissolving under itself through kind of being in tension with its opposition. And again, this is something I see a lot kind of in the way that Shibigi's work plays with systems of knowledge and the ways in which they kind of undermine themselves. Um, here's another one. Another thing about this idea of the mark, the annotation, the caption is that it kind of floats to the surface of the book as an annotation, as marginality, as marginalia, it, it is a kind of almost different strata from the book. Um, it kind of is, it offers up a new time. It's often a kind of time of reception rather than production of the book. Um, so we, I think also I, I would sort of offer that um, idea as something that is a kind of way of upsetting a sort of like geological time or a layered time in which we encounter like an original author who, uh, um, who can be historicized in a particular way. So the marking, captioning really intervenes on the work. Um, and in many of Shubi's uh, pieces, the two techniques I've talked about, the blot, the mark, are working in tandem. Um, so if captioning marginalia displaces the text outside of the time it's written or outside of the intention with which it was made and entangles it with other places and meanings, um, the blot, the territorial stain, kind of roots our knowledge in a specific space, um, in a specific uh, material. And then I'll just briefly talk about this last idea um, of the machine, um, which of course is about functionality, but also about operationality and about how the book kind of acts on us as a material object. Um, so clearly in, in the exhibition, you know, the central figure of, you know, um, uh, machine making kind of is is really the 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 pylon um, and the sort of figure it, it holds for power for electricity um, for things like fracking. Um, in an interview with uh, the Institutum uh, past interview from twenty twenty, Ra had talked about how we tend to kind of venerate 
as a, as a society, we venerate the sky, we venerate what is non-terrestrial and we look down on the earth. And I think part of what's interesting about how the way the pylon and the machine work in the show is almost to kind of re-territorialize the sky um, to show it us uh, the the sky electricity as this kind of air mass. Um, and I and I picked this this detail to show you just of the the watermark, one of the watermarks in space, because you see that there's a lot of blank space around these works, which is something that I found interesting in the sort of design of the show, um, in the sense that these, we have sort of um, specific areas where we see watermarks with these phrases like singing the sky electric, but then also they extend throughout the entire atrium. And I think actually it's important that we see the, the blankness also around these watermarks. And it does make, I think it makes us aware of the kind of negative space um, in the room. Um, and I know I'm getting low on time, so I'll just very briefly run through the past, uh, the last few. Um, but I think again, another thing around this idea of the machine is thinking about kind of recuperation. Again, I think the theme of futility comes up here where we see how kind of um, uh, certain kinds of um, phrases, um, almost literary phrases are kind of um, tweaked here through the lens and figure of the pylon through the figure of power. Um, so that previous slide singing the sky electric um, is like a, uh, or maybe not, not exactly that, that, slide, but that phrase kind of comes from a Walt, or, or sounds very similar to a kind of Walt Whitman um, uh, book, uh, you know, uh, prose from one of the, the poems. Um, and I think that there's this kind of like um, recuperation that kind of happens through the, the machine, the influence of the pylon on language. Um, and this is just a sort of a flashback from an, uh, one of the S. Raul works, Visual Snow, which was also shown as a lecture. And again, I think it's just interesting to see how the kind of machine appeared also in these earlier um, uh, accounts of gallery spaces um, within Shubigi's practice. Um, and yeah, and that is um, really the bulk of uh, my thoughts um, for now. And I will um, hand it over to Alphonse, thank you. Thank you so much, Catherine, and for that really studied and rigorous account of Shubiki's practice. I confess that my own presentation takes on, I would say, a different tenor, but we persist. And thank you so much, Johnny. Thank you so much, X. And quite naturally, thank you, Shubiki, for your lovely works and sparkling minds, without which we would not be gathered here now to converse. The title of my presentation is This Edified Wrath. And the way that I want to go about it is perhaps less of an attempt at a formalistic analysis of Shubigi's works and practice, which are now on view at the Rockbund Art Museum, and more of an attempt at situating within them an effect, a narrative strategy, a preoccupation that sets us on these petrified paths of knowledge, of community, of deaths, and quite importantly, of lives. Central to my critical poesis, if I may, is the eponymous book itself, the moving image which brought me no end of delight, but also grief in the course of my repeated viewing while writing this essay, which is structured in three acts. Before we venture into my observations proper, I also would just like to offer some thoughts on how the moving image has existed in Shubigi's practice. Um, as Catherine just shared um, moments ago, works such as The Yellow Scarf and works such as Talking Leaves, which was the main video installation constituting Shibigi's um, Singapore Pavilion participation at the last edition of La Biennale di Venezia, and other works such as the Pelagic Tracts, which was um, shown in the context of the previous Kochi um, Biennale before Shibigi directed it, um, displays several 
sensitivities and sensibilities, which I thought um, are particularly interesting because they reflect both the technological specificity of the moving image and also of the screen as that first interface and mediator of text, of images, and partly of sounds as well. So kind of tra um, traversing beyond the specific flatness, but also staticity um, to be found in say painting or bookmaking or in the printed page, which um, of which we have already seen, seen three volumes um, out of the pulp series. Um, I think the moving image in Shibuki's practice is particularly fascinating, not just because of how she works with the lens in the capturing of specific visual materials, but also very much in the way she plays with the conventions of what does it mean to make moving image through processes of annotations, captions, um, as well as the different configurations of texts and textual fragments that constitute and oftentimes substitute the mechanisms of narration in providing a larger thematic body or cohesion um, within the works themselves. And so I think these are just some notes that I want to raise and kind of situate in everyone's head before we head proper into this petrified paths. So we begin with poetry, we end with land. In the code opening to, the pet, to this Petrified Paths, a poem by Comitas, um, one of the most important musicology, some say the founding musicology of Armenian culture, unfolds over two delicate shots of manuscripts at the Matinadran, the museum and archive in Yerevan, which serves as the world's largest repository of Armenian manuscripts. Before a spatial leap, to a dark, misty forest, and then to the countryside, where the landscape is punctuated by pylons that litter the grounds like trees. By the highway, our first member of the cast, a former professor turned beekeeper, whom we dwell on for a moment before we return to books and their keepers. The broader idea is literature as territory and word as land. And across the bulk of the film, we encounter these books and their keepers, but not just books and not just keepers. We encounter newspaper clippings, we encounter ancient manuscripts, and we encounter um, snippets of paintings and other visual materials that constitute the bulk of Armenian cultures that have survived various forms of violence, including ongoing efforts, for example, on the, Azer, on the Azerbaijan border in Artsakh. The idea of territoriality in Shibuki's practice, um, once we go beyond the kind of formal territories of craft, reflects an ongoing preoccupation with the notion and the possibility of the palimpsest and how the urban landscape and the archival landscape, the archival space, one could say, serves as this overlaying of community culture and narratives across a rich diversity of time, of timescapes and um, internal geographies, linguistic conventions, as well as social groups. And I think this is what is particularly fascinating when we consider the role of lands that play um, in the various aspects of Shibuki's works, particularly in this petrified paths, where we traverse the multiple narratives and narrative potentials embedded within this geospatial and geotemporal imaginaries. And this is something that is particularly relevant to Armenia's own national history and cultural history from before the establishment of the nation state model, which one would say followed um, the French Revolution. So at once a key node um, near the Caucasus, a key node within the former Ottoman Empire, a key node in the former Soviet Union, and now existing as its own sovereign land with border skirmishes with, Azerbaij um, with Azerbaijan, who has for decades now continued this genocidal efforts initially launched um, most um, obviously during Ottoman um, occupation. And so 
what is particularly interesting is to, of course, um, examine the function of books, texts, manuscripts, poems, and of course, writers as this scattered um, dispersal of Armenia as a whole, reconstituted in various times, reconstituted in various places. And in this formation of the Armenian nation state, the centralization of history that nonetheless reflects um, a variety of diverse granular subjectivities um, that go against, one would say, the kind of objective fictions of nationhood. And this is something, for example, discussed at large across the different writers and uh, relatives of writers who just talk about um, the kind of fraught histories that writing has occupied centrally within the different um, occupation, um, occupied histories of Armenia. And of course, kind of um, undergirding this realization of the powers of text, textuality, storytelling um, as a modality, we also very much um, have to unpack this different um, political economies and ecologies that underline the development of infrastructures across the Armenian countryside. Um, the presence of oil within, say, Baku um, as the key petrol capital of Azerbaijan has also, of course, led to the recalibration of the Azerbaijan-Armenian um, tensions conflict, or one could say much more bluntly, genocide, um, within the kind of contemporary news media cycle. And this is what I thought is particularly moving, but also particularly astute in Shubigi's visual um, analysis, where she eschews the conventions of that broad banked um, geopolitical um, kind of polemic in favor of understanding um, the explicit textures of survival and survivance within these extant communities. And thus, this kind of comple complex tapestry of cultures, visual cultures, material cultures constitute this polyphony of voices. And this is um, a theme that I will pick up on later um, in the presentation as well. But very crucially, um, the landscape and land plays a central part, um, even though it is not always explicitly foregrounded within the bulk of runtimes of work such as this petrified path, in playing um, a role of the archive and also the witness to this um, past and continual violences and traumas. And so the, in this way, the kind of larger scales of infrastructure, such as the pylons um, illustrated in my previous plates um, still, and also um, in Catherine's analysis, provides the specific visual metaphors that grounds um, the accounts of development and the violence of modernization, industrialization within this specific territories that Shibugi goes on to um, explore. Next, um, inarticulable. Grigor Akemian, the son of the once exiled writer and poet Gurga Mahari, does not speak in this petrified part. Or maybe he does, but we do not hear. The idea of silence, soundscapes, uh, music, translation, narration, and of course the political economy of erasure is something that also lies um, really, really central to the kind of diegetic framing um, of narratives and stories within works such as this petrified paths. So whether it is in this kind of fly on the wall observations of documentations, of discussions, conversations, chats, oral histories, gossip, as some may say, um, within the context of this closed social circles and between co-workers discussing um, the specificities of their works and labor, to Shubigi as an observer, um, what is articulated, what is not articulated, what is inarticulable is what I would say um, a key um, function within Shubigi's works um, and analysis with this compositing and um, assemblage of different voices um, speaks to something that is not, um, speaks to subject matters that are commonly not explicitly discussed um, in the spaces. So 
um, the role in which you know violence is faced within the internal spaces, within the interiority of nation states and nation ident national identities coalescing, for example, um, arises um, in this specific um, instance, which in the film kind of talks about um, the need to bury traces um, of associations with writers, poets, organizers, um, witnesses, um, simply, you know, even the context of the development of Armenian society. So in this particular moment that we witness, or rather bear witness to, um, we, we, li we listen to how um, this different Armenian scholars um, and, and, and relatives and cultural workers describe um, the mechanisms through which, you know, certain associations with figures um, of the kind of cultural public has to be hidden to avoid um, facing larger violences within the context of the um, political elites with, within Soviet Armenia itself. So in one instance, you know, objects, artifacts um, of writers has to be buried by family members who shun and, you know, um, exist in this perennial fear of you know being subject to this larger political systems of interrogation. Meanwhile, in other cases, you know, we hear accounts of where um, funerals of writers are only scantily um, attended, if only because to avoid um, the necessity of the immediate visual association with such writers um, within the political calculus um, of Armenian statehood in various configurations. So in this instances, um, silence um, that are now surfaced and re-articulated surface this powerful metaphors and, and also conduits to which this under-discussed narratives could be finally brought to the fore. And here, I also would like to highlight um, the kind of centeredness of narrations, not by Shubigi, but by um, the various constellating um, stories that she encounter and put together serves. And this I thought is particularly interesting, particularly um, where it pertains to also then um, the ways in which Shibigi works with the moving image and text, where she overlays um, excerpts and fragments um, of writing. Sometimes um, they have take on this citational quality, sometimes there are direct quotations of poetry, and sometimes there are original works of poetic um, thoughts that should kind of embed within the visual field of the moving images themselves that kind of provide a different texture and also a different um, layer of narrativity that goes beyond the standard documenta um, documentary impulses of the documentarian's voice. And so in this way, Shibuki allows the lens and allows our ears to hear, the, hear for themselves. And this is, um, for example, um, what I would want to maybe bring into conversations um, with other um, writers and, 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 and artists who may deploy these forms of sonic witnessing to allow for this much more texture layered, but also this kind of submerged and subterfuging possibilities to arise in our very um, sonic perceptions where we hear what is not spoken as, and we read what is not written. And of course, in this kind of compositing of the different textualities and different possibilities of the textual modes, um, for example, in this different um, illustrations that, you know, is kind of set against boxes of archival material, stacks of, you know, old fragments of text, um, commonly of which include um, manuscripts, catalogs, um, newspaper clippings, or other, you know, other notions of textual ephemera, create this rich and densely layered um, forms of understanding how text could be understood um, as this very object or as this very material of communication that exists to surface and kind of coagulate the different um, communal voices that exist. And in this case, the kind of multiplicities, pl polyphonies, and pluralities that are embedded in the necessity of Armenian cultural survival. And illustrations um, such as this, which we encounter midway through the film, 
also bring to the fore um, the possibilities of solidarity that go beyond the kind of uniform and monolithic reading of Armenian national history, which we encounter, in fact, in the very beginning of the film, where the idea of the literary canon, you know, was discussed at large as this kind of soft technology within which social memory and histories um, are coalesces to create this kind of singular narrative of the nationhood. And of course, you know, in kind of um, presenting these different relationalities, and here we see the granddaughter of um, of a poet, um, of a poet, of a woman poet who never got her due recognition um, in Armenian literary and social history, presents this kind of different forms of anguishes, anxieties, but also this kind of persistence, resilience, and survivance that we see in say, and that are um, discussed in say, in larger quantities and modes in, in the works of indigenous studies, scholars, and landscape. And what is really important um, that I want to bring up once and again is the political economy of erasure, not just in the kind of violent obliterations um, of artifacts such as um, discussed midway through the film in the kind of destruction of cross stones um, on, on, on Azari territories of these traces of Armenian presences and heritage, but also in this kind of direct omission of key voices within society of social groups and communities that aren't largely acknowledged through also internal social forces at large of sexism, racism, and as well as, you know, different unfolding of generational trauma. So bringing me um, into this kind of um, into my last points and my larger kind of thematic observations um, of the chorus, collectivity, social groups, and the kind of lineage of recitation plays the central role in not just highlighting the long durée of Armenian histories, but also in the kind of persistence and the diversity of the different voices that constitute um, all the different Armenians that continue and continue to exist. Um, that persist and continue to exist. And thus, you know, this different accounts, this different images, this different texts that we see across so many layers, for example, in the background, the bookshelf containing these different books in the mid ground, um, we see this writer, you know, reading aloud poetry flanked by um, two portraits of, you know, older writers that exist, you know, within different political geographies of violence, erasure, and of course, textuality. Um, this creates this kind of deeply laid and dense understandings of what it means um, for this image, moving image, in fact, to bear witness to the different histories. And even more crucially, um, the ways in which, you know, Shubigi works with subtitles instead of this kind of direct voiceover as commonly found in other documentary works um, in say the kind of visual cultural mainstream also presents um, the necessity for us to listen, but also to read, to kind of allow for the absorption and that kind of active audiencehood um, that are commonly uh, ignored or otherwise eschewed in other forms of archival um, animation. And so kind of taking on um, how Shubigi works with um, the different stories and people she encounters, here I also want to bring you know, forth, you know, this citational mode of allowing other words and fragments to speak um, in this frequently poetic cadences that might trigger in us um, different possibilities. And in the first um, portion, I would like to read um, this quotation, um, now so often repeated that it might be considered a cliche from John Didion. We tell ourselves stories in order to live. We look for the sermon in the su suicide, for the social or moral lesson in the murder of five. We interpret what we see, select the most workable of the multiple choices. We live entirely, especially if we are writers, by the imposition of a narrative line upon disparate images, by the ideas with which we have learned to freeze the shifting phantasmagoria, which is our actual experience. And of course, John Didion occupied a very specific privileged position within the kind of contemporary histories of writing of the American arts and letters. 
And it's just, you know, at this at this point that then I want to bring forth question posed by American studies Saidia Hartman in her now seminal text, Venus in Two Acts. How can narrative embody life in words and at the same time respect what we cannot know? How does one listen for the groans and cries, the undecipherable songs, the cracker of fire in the cane fields, the laments for the dead and the shouts of victory, and then assign words to all of it? Is it possible to construct a story from the locus of impossible speech or resurrect lives from the ruins? Can beauty provide an antidote to dishonor and love a way to exhume buried cries and reanimate the dead? Or is narration its own gift and its own end? That is, all that is realizable with overcoming the past and redeeming the dead are not. And what do stories afford anyway? A way of living in the world in the aftermath of catastrophe and devastation. A home in the world for the mutilated and violated self. For whom? For us and for them? We live in order to tell ourselves stories, animated in our path, thick and trembling, walking along these petrified paths. I know that it is these edified rafts that may continue to haunt us and keep us going long after our words have faded as ink do on paper. Thank you so much. And yes, I believe now we pass the time on to X. Well, thank you so much, Alphonse and Catherine, for really fascinating and thought-provoking presentations. And uh, I feel like we need a whole day to unpack because you guys packed so much into the presentations. I really feel like, wow, Shubigi's practice is flashing in, you know, in front of my in front of me and I taking the notes and I originally I wanted to talk about three F's in this conversation, the failure, the fragility, and the fiction in Shubiki's practice. But after listening to your presentations, I end up writing down who is Shubigi? Because I find it interesting, especially when Catherine bring up the death of Esraou kind of thinking about where Shubiki's practice was, um, this kind of undercover or or kind of um, um, creating this kind of fictional character of Esra Wu and playing this very long game of 10 years not showing publicly as Shubiki and later on killed Esra Wu and Third River of Ink. And then starting with... Um, body is work that are also in many ways are fragmented, but yet cohesive, right? Through your writing and through your, as Catherine pointed out, block making and mark making and through what Afonso talked about, um, the kind of mechanisms of narration in film and moving image. And I think now I look holistically with these presentations, I realize actually Shubiki, you reach each individual modes of practice slightly different with a different subjectivity. And when you are a filmmaker, you know, you didn't choose to use a fiction or directing a film, but rather you choose a documentary style, right? And then you almost come in as a witness or creating a certain kind of archive. But when you're writing, it's a different kind of voice. And then in your personal notes that we uncovered and showed in the exhibitions, these are where the humor of you comes in. And then you let the slippage of these kind of um, different um, zone of kind of thinking emerge and kind of become more flu in flux with each other. So maybe I will open by asking a very basic question of Shubigi. When you... Um, listen to these presentation because I think always as an artist listening to other people talking about your work you must have a lot of reflections and also thoughts I wanted you to tell us who is Shubiki and who is Shubiki in different kinds of practices in your own words <laughs> that's an impossible thing to answer <laughs> thank you 
<laughs> but um, I, I really want to thank you, um, X, for, as always, this, continuing this conversation that we began so long ago. Um, Catherine and Alphonse, I, I sort of vacillated between just being absolutely amazed by your insights um, and also, th you know, putting together things that um, aren't always readily apparent. And very often I feel that I a lot of what I do suspiciously like an inside joke. Um, and that it's self-ingesting humor, um, you know, in in with all its catalogical connotations. Um, and then it's not, it's a very often not very accessible in that way, but it's really brilliant how you all, I mean, the fact that you all can see it straight away and put it together in ways that even I didn't um, intend, intend to imagine is really very edifying for me. So thank you. Um, but also I think um, to go back to your question, I think in a nutshell, I have indiscriminate appetites. In, in every sense. Um, and part of part of my persona, which actually didn't end with S. Rahul, is to be as nondescript in person as possible, to allow for really actually the fact that there is value to being a generalist for, at one. Um, I've resisted as many attempts as possible to specialize my own natural inclination to go down rabbit holes in, and, to, and, to over, and to specialize in a very narrow field has always been there and is the one thing I fought against. So I have indiscriminate appetites, yes, and that that deals a lot with the way I I'm restlessly moving from one idea, one medium, one thing to another. Like right now, again, um, I'm I'm making I've already started a new film. I'm in the Philippines right now, as a matter of fact, working on that, um, and it's quite radically different, of course, to what I did in Armenia. And I do always feel very torn about this. I do feel that um, I I'd, I would love to have actually spent so I would have loved to have spent years on just one idea, one place, and so on. I don't think there's enough time ever. And um, I also don't think I can, I, I would be able to do that. So this kind of idea of of being indiscriminate means really actually also roving. So roving between places, ideas, um, situations means that you also have to be rooted in a certain kind of, I don't like this word, but we use it anyway, universalism. Um, in other words, you have to be able to speak or listen to something that is regionally specific, perhaps, or, or specific to a certain situation or community. But you also need to be able to recognize, without twisting it, um, how resonant it is in other ways and in other times and, of course, through history. So because I was an indiscriminate reader as a child, and that includes largely reading a lot of history, um, because I loved it so much, I don't know why. And um, it was my main diet, actually, my main a form of reading. Um, it meant that I don't actually see uh, very clear linear thought progressions. When I film, I have to do that though. I have to think narratively even when I'm doing the artistic documentary form. Um, I think I have always called myself an artist because it allows me, it's very liberating, I can do whatever I want. Um, if I were a historian, I wouldn't be able to and so on and so forth. If I was a writer, I wouldn't be able to do a lot of what I did. I do. If I was trained in film, I wouldn't be able to function outside of that training as much as I can thumb my nose right now at a lot of things that I know I should be doing, especially technically, and then I choose not to do. Um, or, or I demand of myself that I don't do it. I think that comes from also a very perverse pleasure that I take in um, the forms that I admire are not necessarily ones I want to replicate. I don't know why that city exists but um um that that's the second aspect i think so when you say who am i for that's actually a slightly mortifying question because i, I it's it's not something i want to foreground um with the sral project the joy of it was it was not about shubigi it, it was not about the artist or the writer or it was um he was a foil in many ways but he he was also um the one who shadow boxed with the viewer or the reader i didn't have to do any of that um, nothing that I made would ever be read through the lens of my ethnicity or gender or any of those derailing things that people do when they want to be dismissive about something. And we've seen this a lot, in, um, especially if you're talking the late 90s, early 2000s in, in the art world and in academia. I mean, not that much has changed right now. Um, it's all Some of it can be very superficial change. Um, so I think that the SRL project was, was um, it came from rage, of course, it came from that kind of feminist rage. But it was it served so many distinct purposes, a number of which Catherine actually pointed out. And I'm, you know, I really love that you picked up on so much of this. Um, the fact that it was erudition that was completely unnecessary. Um, and I, I have spoken about S. Raul and uh, described him as being having the, uh, you know, thinking he has the 
the ideals of the enlightenment but actually has a squishy innards of the of the romantic and um, th what does that kind of because there's also this idea of western modes of knowledge being always dichotomous and so when you're faced with a binary it tears you into which is as we know a very foolish notion but we, this is the early 2000s when we i don't think this conversation was yet as mainstream especially in in um in the circles that I was living and working in, which is an art school, academia, and so on. Um, it wasn't. I mean, it it wasn't as as uh, ridiculed as yet. So I could re joyfully ridicule these ideas through S. Raoul, which I wouldn't have been able to get away with as you know with me as myself. Um, I'm quite happy to not be identifiable, um, in that in that way, uh, or be associated with a kind of. I I, I think the mock seriousness of S. Raoul. Um, mock turtle, sadly, into a kind of real seriousness that I have now, but that's because of the nature of the project. I think once the project ends, I'd probably embrace again a kind of savage sat satirism. I don't know. Um, I, I think it, it's 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 needed because this just the um, the the sense of doom and despair is suffocating. I think we all know what is what I'm speak what I speak of, um, and it's especially acute for people who are very young. Um, this is the world they're born into and it's burning all around them. Uh, I think there's that a sort of savagery in your response is needed. And I think the measured tones that I've employed for so long with Palpa, not what I want to continue anymore. So I think, <laughs> again, to very weirdly <laughs> go back to your question, yeah. um, I think it's really important to, the idea of being indiscriminate means also you don't allow yourself to get fixed or pinned down, even by yourself. I think this is a great um segment into the question I, I want to ask Catherine is the kind of the subversion that is inherent in your practice and in your being in the world, Shubigi. Um, you you mentioned that um, um, two clear bishops kind of a short essay about research, uh, kind of a critique of research-based practices. You saying that Shubigi's practice is a subversion to that and in a way that it's not asserting um, it as knowledge, which I find is super interesting because so much of Shubigi's work is directly, um, it's not, a research-based practice in my perspective. It is writing research as practice, as way of life, right? Um, and um, and so much of this is about the useless or kind of be deemed useless knowledge as well as the useful knowledge. So I guess the question is, um, if you could expand a bit more um, from that point of kind of thinking about Shubigi's practice it's in relationship to this kind of broader sense of other artists who work in this kind of research-based direction, because I do think Shubigi's practice is quite distinct from that, um, you can call that kind of a milieu of working um, in this generation of artists, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for that question. And I completely agree. I think also that maybe, you know, in, in responding, it's worth maybe just reiterating what you're saying about the like multifaceted nature of Shubiki's practice, where yes, definitely, of course, um, research is extremely important. And I also think it's it's great that we brought up the sort of different registers maybe that are that should be accesses, say, within films in the more documentary mode versus in kind of a more of a gal like a you know, white cubes gallery setting. Um, I do think there's, you know, there's this playfulness to the work that often kind of offers itself up um, for the viewer in a way that is not, um, it's not declarative maybe in the same way that certain kinds of, um, let's say the archive generation are. And I think what you what you mentioned about the kind of recovery of what would appear to be useless knowledge or marginal knowledge maybe is part of that, where in fact, because uh, oftentimes it feels like a kind of the tome recedes, the sort of systematic body of knowledge recedes, and we actually see the sort of more fragmented knowledge or research come to the fore as the kind of, is the thing that grounds us and that gives us material to use. I, I feel that, um, yeah, I, I think, I guess I'm I'm sort of agreeing with you and kind of maybe trying to complicate the idea of, of what it 
means to be or not be research-based and play with that or resist that. Um, and of course, it's hard to pin down, I think, because of all the reasons we've talked about that um, really, you know, Shubiki's work is multifaceted. It, it doesn't necessarily dwell in one place into kind of um, uh, fixed a way. So yeah, I think I think that playfulness, but I think exactly because of that kind of attention to the margins, um, we, we see the kind of like this systematic core of knowledge kind of recede and we see it more as it is in context as it's used rather than kind of as a, as a sort of archive that is um, disembodied or purely kind of, um, you know, purely classifiable in some way. I hope that maybe answers or addresses yeah, your question. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and speaking of the margins, um, Afons, I'm very much intrigued by the way you're thinking about internal geographies in Shubigi's work, which I haven't really thought about in that way until your presentation today. And I feel like it's just kind of begin to make me, I mean, Shubigi and I talk about, you know, her upbringing and being kind of grew up in this more diasporic con conditions and also thinking about um, relationship to geographies and um, objective fiction of nationhood, et cetera. But I think I would be very much interested in if you could expand a bit more on kind of the concept of territorization and geography in kind of relationship to film practice of Shubigis and then how like, um, I think in particular, how is let's say Shubigi as a witness entering places like Armenia and which it has a very complex geography and um, how is um, her approach to that um, is um, yeah is unique I guess in that way yeah no, thank you so much for that and of course you know thank you to Shivagi for making said work so that we can you know um um take at the seams of it um for fun uh, for conviviality and collegiality if nothing else um I think for me this notion of geography um territory territorialization where it pertains to um Shubiki, particular mode of witnessing I think it is really interesting um actually when um if we begin actually from a formal register to look at the way in which she dislocates um text from you know on and off you know the kind of diegetic um universe so mm -hmm. um in the shibiki moving image you know we always see how um text appear in multiple valences as subtitles as you know as this kind of like textual overlays and of course as captured um, within the context of the image that she's filming. So in the kind of manuscripts that she pans over or focuses on or, you know, zooms in. And I think, you know, um, beginning with that kind of different layers and modalities through which text gets to exist and uh, and thus, you know, the kind of significant um, text as signifier, um, the different modes of how that get to register, you know, both to, I would say, Shibigi at the moment of witnessing and also, you know, and the back end editing it and then, you know, to the audience. I think that is what's really, really interesting um, for me as a starting point, because um, I would say that, you know, kind of hand in hand with this notion of textuality and the different layers of disambiguation, but also dislocation, um, what is always very um, apparent and by which, you know, I didn't talk about maybe as much in my presentation is also the kind of acoustic and sonic elements of it where, we have never heard Shibiki's voice in a Shibiki yes, movie exactly. image ever. And I think, you know, that choice to kind of decenter the vocality of the authorship of authorship and of the author um, itself as a position of, you know, arbitrating kind of truth or reality or objectivity, which, you know, as we have kind of um, alluded to multiple times in these conversations and, you know, in Catherine's earlier um, presentation as being, um, a work of useful fiction, in fact. Um, I think, you know, these are the different tactics, uh, medial tactics that really, I would say, begins the first step to reconstituting and reconsidering what it means to work with, you know, territories and geographies um, in, 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 in how Shibigi, um, um thematic as well as kind of geopolitical um, unfurling happens. 
in the context of this petrified path and kind of maybe examining, you know, the kind of Shubiki as creator, as, as, as onlooker relative to Armenia, I thought what was really interesting was kind of multiple positions that she actually alluded to and kind of excavated, even within the kind of archetype of the exiled and the imperiled writer. So, you know, um, there were specific moments of acknowledgement of that, say, um, gender roles and sexism that was embedded within, you know, Armenian society that I thought were particularly poignant and powerful to me because it shows that, you know, just because, you know, as a larger demographic society or community, you know, that is facing a very particular sort of epistemic and physical violence through that, say, genocide and the kind of epistemicide and culture side, you know, does not necessarily preclude, you know, the community from asserting different violences within its own kind of internal boundaries and internal imaginaries. And I think that is a kind of terrain that is really fraught and really, really needs to be um acknowledged because you know for example talking about um the difficulties and 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 the problems the sheer danger faced by the writer of burning orchard um you know it was the the violence that was being inflicted was from armenian marxist you know armenian social um, armenian socialist so you know, just because it accounts for um, the genocide being inflicted by, say, Ottoman power does not necessarily, you know, detach the kind of complicity and entanglements that, you know, different pockets of internal communities and 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 groups necessarily um, have um, with this kind of larger forces or this kind of larger political movements um, towards displacements and dislocations. And I think this kind of... Um, ambivalence of this kind of um this ambivalence I wouldn't maybe use the word ambivalence so much but it is the only word that comes to mind but this kind of uneasy coexistence between the recognition that you know violence is not just external but also internal it is not just exterior but it is also the forces of, of interiority in trying to write you know illegible histories of a larger community I think that is what is you know so fascinating about um, Shubigi's um, approach. So yeah, I mean, this also, of course, pertains to the multiple geographies um, that um, Shubigi has transposed, you know, in different works that target that target different kind of understanding. For example, you know, in um, the Pelagic Tracts, um, which is an earlier work that Shubigi made for um, the previous previous um, Koji Missouri's um, Biennale, you know, this kind of parafictional encounter between um, a colonial officer that didn't exist as a specific person, but it definitely is an archetype as, as a mode of relation, you know, also goes hand in hand with, say, um, the kind of narrativity and the kind of metatextual analysis of um, the thuggies and its relationalities to the kind of contemporary usage of um, the term thugs um, in the yellow scarf. And, you know, this is, and this kind of metatextuality as kind of common thread that links each of this Shibigu works is what I would say to be so evocative and powerful because there are specific ways in which a Shibigu Rao moving image exists, which, you know, you, come, you can pin it down as Shibigu, but you don't know what exactly you're pinning down. It's like, it's it's almost as if you know this is this discursive non de plume that that Shivigi has adopted, which is so interesting because it is precisely as Shivigi and what Catherine said they're they're unclassifiable, but their unclass their unclassifiability itself presents, you know, a very specific relationality and yeah, those are maybe just some of my fanboy moments um emerging, <laughs> but I hope that no, I sem um, somewhat answers your question. Of course, and also um, I asked a very broad question. I probably will take a whole book to really explain uh, all of that, but it's just really for me, it's a beginning of for us to kind of expand it, how we kind of approach to thinking about Shubigi's work. As you were answering the question, I thought about actually one of my favorite work in the show is, is a last addition to um, the exhibition that we kind of made the decision just while we making the exhibition, which is her cell phone footage um, in our media and edit it together. I don't know. She said she just edited. It. She said it's just like that. I was like, this looks amazing. Like, how can anyone's cell phone footage just look like that? And it just landscape. 
and soundscape of 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 the um the dusk and stones and um of armenia and she later on put a book of pulp underneath the tele um, tele um crt monitor and we put some plants next to it and it became one of my favorite moments in the exhibition um, I want to kind of with the time, I know we're running over, but I maybe just want to circle back on one really important thing, which um, both of you have mentioned, which is authorship. Um, and I think that is why I asked with Shubigi, right? I think there is a very particular way that Shubigi, you dealt with authorship and different forms of authorship. And I really love, Catherine, your term, this kind of ecologically grounded knowledge. I wonder if there's such thing as a ecologically grounded authorship. Um, this is a question to you, Shubigi. And uh, would you consider, um, yeah, would, is there such thing to you as, First of all, when you kind of, I mean, I think you, we all know that when you think of knowledge, it's much, in, it's a not a kind of a Western canonized knowledge that we're talking about. It's, it's multifaceted and it's a diverse forms of knowledge production. But, um, and how is, how important is groundedness in your practice? Because you talk about universality is actually a kind of a radical mm -hmm. subversion to that. But I also think you are truly a also deeply grounded um, thinker and yes. practitioner. So I, I'm curious about that kind of eco ecologically groundedness in your work and how you approach that in relationship mm -hmm. to this universal perspective as well. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I think maybe I should have specified universalisms aren't human centric ones at all. For me, that's the opposite. I wasn't brought up that way. And that's not how I think anyway, which is why the earth as strata became such a prominent thing right down to the fact that it even um, helped us sort of figure out the, the layout of the show. Um, um, in horizontal and vertical terms. Yeah. Um, and even then kind of decided how the works on cloth with lace, cashmere, et cetera, how those ones unfolded. Um, sorry, for fun. Um, I think when I whenever I think of knowledge or in any form, um you and this is the case I think with almost every 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 time we look at any field where we are trying to where, where they are baked in inequities, right? And very often because of colonization in particular, which means there's a there's a mode and a model that's been employed here, which is one of imposition, oppression, and erasure, right? Um so whenever you look at knowledge and you look at any any field of thing, the you have to first do that exhausting labor of also unlearning all the stuff that you have been exposed to, um, which is a which is a product or a byproduct, a very deliberate product, by the way, of a lot of um, colonial um, enforcing of right, wrong, morality, knowledge privileging, um, information privileging, hierarchy, any basically any hierarchical structure. So, in a nutshell, authorship to me represents ownership. It's a form of ownership. But what I've tried to do when I write, and I think this is the first time I'm publicly admitting it, authorship for me in the pulp project is about culpability not ownership. So I, it's a position that I decided after hiding behind S. Raul, I decided to go to the other extreme as far as possible and be extremely vulnerable in the way I write. And this is very evident in pulp volume one and volume two, especially um, where I am very open about how I feel about the people I, I worked with and I filmed, um, how completely lost I felt sometimes and how how deep that pain goes, um, what it does, how it derails you. Um, I spoke, all, I think at the end of Pulp Volume 2, I talk about what have I learned over these last few years of, of loneliness, fright, and they use these terms very deliberately. Um, I speak about friendships gain because of the work, but also how much I've lost as a consequence. And I do firmly personalize myself. So there's a, when I say culpability, it's multifold. One is you have to be vulnerable when you're doing a project like this. You have to, you have to allow other people to be critical about your position, because as we know, one of the things that's very easy to do as an artist is to parachute into a place and take someone's lived experience and turn it into your own project and you bask in its reflected glory. And that is something that really sets my teeth on edge. Obviously, I think it does for a lot of us. How, and and I do still agonize over the ethics of almost everything I do. I'm sure I've made plenty of missteps as well. But one of the ways in which when I write, I have more control over the material. And that's why uh, one of the ways of discussing the nature of control as a writer um, is to actually speak about culpability. I do implicate myself as being 
the opposite of the dispassionate observer. Um, and it's very necessary to do that. I tr I have tried to a certain extent to do it when I film. Um, I do know that the camera is extremely an extremely intrusive tool with this horrendous history as well um, of, a pro of taking and 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 it's not an it's not an equal it's, there's there's no equal relationship. The person with the camera really controls what's happening. So I have tried to bypass that through various modes, which are perhaps not visible in the end product, but are very much there in the process of how I film people, who I choose to sort of you know um how people decide actually or tend to direct what gets spoken about. They uh, if they ask me even after fact, I will redact material and so on. Um, I think this is what what perhaps I would think of as groundedness. So you have to be grounded not in the the territory of your own making or your own definition. And as authors, we are we are always defining territory, whether we like to admit it or not. And when I talk about culpability, what I mean is I have to expose myself to um, disappointment and um, anger by some of the people who have trusted me. And I know that it's going to, it will probably happen sometime. I'm, they, people are not, I mean, they probably have this idea in their heads of how they'll appear and then it doesn't, it never matches up, right? Um, and I also know that it's very necessary for me to be in a position where I can receive it because I am grounded in their territory. Um, so my grounding, the to overextend the metaphor, um, I, it's constantly shifting and it shifts with every single new film, but it also shifts every day in every shoot. And, in every, and that's the reason, again, I don't use a crew or work with the crew because then you're having these internal conversations and you're discussing the day shooting at the end of it. And then you, you, you know, you're in your own little spin about, oh, how to make it technically more, um, how to finesse it. And I, I don't want any of those conversations to be present. I want to be agonizing by myself alone in my hotel room at night. Um, and feeling absolutely miserable despite what was seemingly a very productive day. I want to feel unmanned by the nature of what I've listened to. I want to be, it's not about mere discomfort. It's about feeling completely lost in this terrain. That is a form of grounding because then you have to find your footing again. And the only way to find your footing is to reestablish your position vis-a-vis -vis the material every single day. So it's not like, okay, this is my position. So when people ask me, you know, what's the Pulp Project really about? I really, it's it's a struggle every time. So, and I mean, finally we have this thing in the bio, et cetera. It's a project about book and library instruction, but it's really also not, it's not none of these things. And that's why I think um, it's really important that, and I'm also really aware of this as a middle-aged person, the brain, our brains are inherently lazy and they want to repeat something that works and it's it's you can see this even in, in the practice in certain practices artistic practices when something works you tend to be repetitive about it um i know that that tendency is there and that fear of stagnation drives me to again remove myself from the process even though i'm the one conducting it or seemingly conducting it and that's of course in when i film but also when i write so i never uh i, I mean i often I often hear writers talk about, especially when they're when they're doing the acceptance speeches for a prize they won. They often talk about what it's like to the sense of isolation they feel when they're writing their books and all of that. I I honestly don't know what that's like because I don't feel isolated at all when I write because there there are a thousand voices um clamoring at me constantly um when I write because we draw from a wellspring uh, wellspring of collective knowledge every time we write. Every time we film, we're drawing on, on the work of others. And you need to attribute um, as far as possible. I mean, you can't name or enumerate every single source, right? Or in, inspiration or, or even things that have fed into you and things that you've disagreed with violently. But you have to know that you are not the sole author. You can never be the sole author. So for me, that is, that's how I think as well. Um, and also, again, in non-human centric terms, um, I think it is an ecologically grounded writer. I'm not really sure if I would ever call myself that because it would make it seem like it's a deliberate choice that I've made when I haven't really. I think from a very young age, my mother was quite clear about uh, puncturing that myth of human superiority. Um, She's always done it with us. Um, and I think that was that's one of the most valuable lessons I learned. Uh, it wasn't she didn't teach us about human frailty as much as she taught us about the wealth of knowledge and and, and just the sheer scale dimensions of life on this planet. Um, and this is only one planet. So, I mean, that that and rather than feeling insignificant in the face of that, understand that it's okay to be a dust moat in the grand scale of things. And that's enough. 
So that kind, it's not a form of erasure. It's not a form, and it goes against a lot of what we've been taught in this kind of individualism and the need to make your bones as yourself. And this perhaps goes back to the earlier question you asked about who I am, which is I'm still slightly uncomfortable um, uh, with that spotlight. Um, but um, what I what I'm trying to say, I think, is that you can't you can't be fixed in a point and fixed in a place. Grounding doesn't mean finding your footing and then consolidating it. You have to be you have to be aware that everything's constantly shifting beneath you. And if it doesn't shift, you need to tip it. You need to pull the rug out yourself from under your feet. Constant uprooting and rerooting yourself. And as a friend of mine told me that the root and radical share the same roots. So thank you, Shubhiki, for and for Catherine and Alphonse to share your really brilliant um, insights um, into Shubiki's practice, into ideas of knowledge, um, of narrations, of geographies, of um, textualities, of uh, machineries. And um, I think as the audience are watching this program, this is our closing program for Shubiki's Deep Petrified Pass, which I personally consider it's one of my most um, fruitful um, curatorial collaboration that I had, um, definitely at REM, but potentially um, in my entire career. And um, so I want to thank you, Shubigi, for just the opportunity to collaborate with you and for your, like, truly your openness to collaboration when you say there's, you know, um, shared authorities. I think there, I really not always the, the kind of the case when you work in artists that you feel there is a true openness to kind of additional um, co conspire you know, co um, I guess, what is the right word? I guess co-authoring or co-making a something that it's beyond both of us. I think this is what I felt um, happened in this project. So I really want to really offer my sincere thanks from myself personally, but also from the museum. And uh, for everyone's watching, I hope you really enjoyed um, this conversation. And I hope you really um, able to enjoy the exhibition, which I believe was extremely um, successful um, in the sense of um, the context in locally in China and in Shanghai. And um, the museum will close um, after the closing of the program of Shubigi's exhibition and reopen again in March 22nd with a new year-long research initiative that in part, I will think, inspired by our collaboration, Shubigi, and also, of course, um, collaboration um, that I had with some other artists as well in relationship to kind of thinking about diverse form of knowledge. And the spring program that we have in 2024 um, looks back into our own shifting grounds, um, particularly in Shanghai, and uh, looking into our own local histories and local archives and um, local complex geographies. So I hope you all will come back to the museum and I hope to welcome both of you, Afons and Catherine, back to the museum again um, and uh, hope this conversation will continue I know Shubiki you will be coming back <laughs> and you you already you already on our advisory board for this project as you know um, so um, thank you very much for being here and thank you and wishing everyone a fantastic um, weekend thank you thank you so, thank much, you so much for this thank you so much great it's been an incredible time